Hi guys! On today's coloring tutorial, we're going to be coloring this picture, which is called Faye Enchantress from the Magical Beauties Coloring Book Volume 1. If you are a patron of mine, thank you, I love you, and you can find your free download for this tutorial on my Patreon page in the Patrons Only section. Just for you. So, the first thing I do when I'm starting a coloring page that has a person or a character in it is figure out what color I want to do their skin tone. Um, now a lot of people ask, you know, what color is flesh? What color do I use to color skin tone? And the answer to that is that there's all kinds of colors that you can use for skin tones. And so what it really is up to is what kind of effect you're going for. Do you want to color somebody with a very pale complexion? Somebody with a very dark complexion? Somebody in between? Um, you know, look around at different colors of people and see what uh, colors they are because there's quite a variety in uh, skin tone and complexion and all of that. So for this one, I want to do a very pale kind of skin tone, since she's kind of a ethereal looking fairy type of character. In some of my books, including the Magical Beauties book, um, I use some grayscale shading in there to um, give you guys some idea of how to shade and shadow and where the shadows are going to fall. I also have a grayscale testing sheet included with that book. And what you can learn by using this grayscale testing sheet is the uh, level of transparency and opacity in each individual color because each individual color formulation, each pencil in your set has its own level of transparency or opacity and uh, you can use this testing sheet to discover that. So to demonstrate how this grayscale testing sheet works, I have two different flesh tones here. They're both kind of pale peach colors. One of them is from my Polychromo set and one of them is from my Prismacolor set. And the main difference between them is that one of them is opaque and one of them is transparent. So opaque is the opposite of transparent. So transparent, if you can see through it, if it's clear, it's kind of, you know, stuff, you, you can layer it over stuff and you can see what's beneath it as an opaque color or even a translucent color which is kind of between opaque and transparent translucent is like foggy kind of effect um, so when you color your swatch over your grayscale test sheet what you're able to see is how those colors look over that dark area and if they show up light over the dark area you know that your color is opaque and not completely transparent and you can use opaque colors over grayscale areas but um, the transparent ones are going to look better they're going to tint your darks instead of you know having this kind of foggy effect over them so especially in the darker areas of grayscale if you're if you're going over a grayscale area you want to try to uh, find transparent colors and you can use your testing sheet to figure out which of your colors are transparent one thing I always do when I'm coloring is I keep a, a blank sheet of paper, a scratch sheet of paper underneath my page and I call it my scribble sheet and I use it to test out my colors. Um, in this case, I'm just going to use the back side of this grayscale testing sheet. And here I'm just testing my, I've decided to go with the Polychromos color cinnamon. Um, so I'm just kind of testing a swatch here to see what my color looks like. I'm using light pressure at the beginning and then also seeing what it looks like when I use harder pressure um, and you can see that you can get quite a variety of tones just from one pencil just by using uh, different levels of pressure. Now I'm just going to start here uh, laying in a nice light layer of this uh, cinnamon color. Don't worry about if it looks grainy right now. If you're using a light pressure, it's gonna look grainy pretty much on any kind of paper, uh, but we're going to fix that later. We're going to, well, I'm gonna show you a technique called burnishing, but burnishing doesn't happen until the end, until you've got your colors exactly the way you want them. Um, so for now, we're just gonna do a nice light coverage of this cinnamon color and try to get it as smooth as possible. And one of the ways that you can do that is to use a kind of a circular 
uh, stroke with the tip of your pencil. So I usually kind of do just kind of an oval and I go around around oval oval scribble 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 and just get my uh, colors down in there and just kind of looking around and if I see spots that are um, have less pigment on there I might go over there again lightly and just even it out um, and if you have areas that are a little bit darker you can kind of darken up the areas around them too by going over that area again adding a little more color maybe putting a little bit more pressure down uh, a lot of this just getting a really smooth application is just practice and just practicing your strokes and practicing building up color until you can get a nice smooth application you'll get the hang of it And when you're coloring grayscale pictures, you always want to make sure that you color over the gray. So I'm doing my light skin tone right over those gray areas where uh, the shadows are. And you want to do that because you want your grays always to be tinted with the color that uh, the object is supposed to be because it's the grayscale just gives you some value. So it makes it look like a darker uh, version of your color that you're using because you're laying it on top of a darker color. And we'll go back in there in a minute and we'll uh, buff up those shadows and darken them so that they're more visible. But for now, we just want to put a base coat down over the entire, uh, all the areas that we want to be that skin tone color. And here we are in the neck part. And again, we're just going to go over that whole area. It's going to look a little funky right now, but it's okay. Well, we'll fix it. And now I'm just going in there and kind of checking out my skin tone evening out some places and just kind of smoothing it out and seeing if there's any paler spots that need a little bit more pigment in there so just checking it out and smoothing it out so for the shadows um, we want to use a color that's kind of a deeper darker color of the flesh tone so I have Three different colors of kind of reddish brown here and I'm just going to color some swatches next to my swatch that I put on my sheet of my skin color so I can see what those colors look like next to uh, the color that I've already used for the skin tone and I'm going to choose uh, one of those colors based on what I think looks best and in this case I'm going to go with the burnt sienna from my Prismacolors collection um, because I just think that looks good it's kind of reddish and uh, I think that'll work the best. The other ones are kind of, have kind of weird, they don't quite match up with the skin tone, so I like this uh, burnt sienna the best. And here's a little demonstration again of how you can use different levels of pressure to get uh, different effects from a single pencil. So this is a, a light application of the burnt sienna and a darker uh, for pressure. So now what you're going to do is you're going to find those gray areas that are the shadowed areas on the face. Um, there's some along the sides, kind of underneath the cheekbones. You'll see some underneath the nose, underneath the mouth, and also along uh, underneath where her uh, crown is. And also in like the inner parts of the ear, I'm going to darken all of those areas up. Um, and you can hopefully still see the gray through there. One thing that you might want to do before you start laying in your base layer is just kind of look around and see, you know, where those shadows are. Because when you put your base layer on, sometimes that could kind of make the gray areas kind of harder to see. Um, and you want to make sure that, that that's kind of your guide for where you're putting your shading. I'm darkening up that burnt sienna around the edges there, so I'm putting a little bit more pressure going over that area again and just uh, applying a little bit more pigment and building up a, a deeper application of the burnt sienna. Um, and you want to kind of do that around the edges of her face where it's kind of receding into the shadows. And anywhere where you want a darker application of that burnt sienna, just either go over it and build up that color or use a little bit more pressure to uh, build up more color and uh, more saturated color.
And you want to try to avoid a real harsh edge on these shadows. You kind of want to blend it into uh, the regular flesh tone so that you have a smooth transition there because uh, hum human flesh is usually pretty soft and diffuse. So you want a blended shadow unless you're doing something with like really dramatic lighting or something and then you might get a sharp edge on that shadow. But in general, for, for human flesh, you're going to want a soft transition between the darker shaded areas and your regular flesh tone. So now we're getting down into this neck area here, and you have the shadow coming down from underneath her chin, um, and that's coming down. She's basically lit from above, and the shadows are falling down on the underside of the surfaces of her face and her body and everything. Um, and if you look, you know, her head is shadowing her neck, and she also has this high collar, so there's not a whole lot of light getting in there. So that whole neck area is going to be a little bit darker than her face that has the full light on it. So you're just gonna go in there. I'm going in there with my burnt sienna and I am, you're gonna have to use probably a little more pressure on the darker areas. And that is because the ink that is already printed on there is a little slippery. Um, but try adjusting your pressure and just keep going until you can get as satisfactory a result as you can. Now, something that's really good to learn if you're coloring pictures is visualization. Visualization. And that's the ability to use your knowledge, your experience, your imagination to create a mental image of what you're considering for your color scheme. And for our Fae Enchantress here, um, I've decided I want to play with kind of a wicked color scheme. Black and green is what going to be my major uh, color for her outfit and her makeup. Now, one thing with the black is I am, as I visualize this and I'm looking at all the different areas that are going to be black, I'm noticing that there's uh, places that overlap that get kind of lost in there and they kind of blend into each other and I want to keep that front edge of the collar separate. So I'm actually going to use uh, some gray in there. So it'll be black and gray. And then we're gonna do several different shades of green in the green areas. Now I'm just swatch testing my colors here. I've got a black and a gray and kind of a bluish gray. Um, and I'm just kind of seeing what those look like and I've decided that I don't really like how the blue gray is working with that but uh, just the black and the gray I think looks good so I'm gonna go with the gray. You may have noticed I have switched to using markers. These are my Crayola Super Tips washable markers. Um, this is a 50 set and these I believe are pretty widely available and they're quite affordable and they're, they're good water-based markers. Um, I recommend them. This 50 set gives you a nice range of colors and um, they're easy to work with for certain applications. They're also really bad for other applications and we'll talk about that as uh, we continue on here. So now I'm just gonna start with kind of the back area of the collar. If you can see how the collar curves around her neck, that's kind of the back of it that you're seeing. Um, and I wanna color that first because that's going to give the uh, front edge some more definition um, and I want to be able to make sure I can see that front edge there because that's where we're going to put our gray area. And now I'm laying in that gray uh, and what I want to do is I want to bring it down to a certain point and I want it to be uh, kind of in line all the way across. So imagine a line where that gray is going to transition into the black and you're going to just color gray down to that line and you can leave kind of an uneven um, edge there that'll kind of help blending. Um, that is called feathering. If you, uh, this is something you can do with markers and colored pencils and really most mediums is um, if you take one color and you kind of sweep it down in a little jagged it, feathery edges and then you bring another color up and feather that into the other color and then that's a way that you can blend colors. Now you'll be noticing on these water-based markers that they are kind of streaky and that is true. Um, it depends on the color really, it depends on the marker. As I say, every single color that you are going to be working with has its own personality, it has its own 
way that it goes down and it has its own way that it plays with others and uh and the way it interacts with the paper and, and all these different things so for me just the experience of practicing and working with your colors and getting to know them um and how they work is just I think the most valuable thing that you can invest in as uh, someone who wants to get better at this is just practice and um, just keep trying until you get better at it. Now here I am going in with the black and this is what I was talking about with that feathering. I'm kind of feathering the black up into the gray area there and I'm overlapping it a bit. And again this is all you know, flexible, you can do it however you want, you can make that transition wherever you want. Um, I just, because I want to kind of have an effect of it's lighter at the top, darker at the bottom, I'm doing that straight across uh, line and that blend of there, and so I'm going to keep where that transition is horizontal across the whole way. Now, what I'm actually doing here is using the gray pencil to blend the black up into uh, the gray area that we already let down. So I'll feather the black up in there and then I'll take the gray and I'll just feather that in between there and that's just gonna give us a little bit more of a, a softer transition between the black and the gray. Now, I'm using both colored pencils and markers here, and uh, the reason I do that is that I generally use the tools that are good at what I want to accomplish, and I already kind of know what everything's good at and what's bad at because I have experimented and explored and practiced, um, and I think that's also how a, a great way for you to learn as well as being exposed to new ideas and and basically, you know, just tuck all this information into your brain and as you're coloring, when an opportunity comes up to use one of these ideas, give it a try and see how it goes and practice. Um, but in general, when it comes to the difference between colored pencils and markers, um, colored pencils are really well suited to do blending and to do uh, more subtle color effects, maybe some more, uh, you know, lighter color effects. Um, markers are very bold. You can't get a whole lot, like when we use the colored pencils to do the soft pressure and the firm pressure, you can get a range of colors out of a colored pencil. With the marker, you just get a flat color and um, you can build up layers to deepen a color in some cases, although you have to be careful not to uh, tear up the paper too much. Because if you get the paper wet, with the ink and then go over it while it's wet you're going to tear up your your surface and you're going to get those little paper pills which are bad and they also tear up your paper so the paper soaks up the ink more and that looks bad so in general when you're doing water-based markers um you're going to want to if you want to build up the color you're going to want to let them dry before you try to layer on some more color you don't want to work wet on wet with markers or with water-based markers. With alcohol markers, you want to do exactly the opposite. You want to work quickly and you want to uh, go wet and wet because with the alcohol, it will actually blend together instead of layering up on top of each other um, when they're wet. And so you can actually get a smooth application of alcohol-based markers, whereas water-based markers are really hard to get smooth. Um, it's really hard to avoid the streaks, even for me. Um, but they're useful for areas where you want, you know, you know you want a bold color, you know you don't want to do any, uh, you know, transitions or gradients or anything, you just want that whole area to be a single flat color. Markers are good for this, and um, as I said, it depends on the color, the level of streakiness, the darker the color, they're usually a little bit smoother, the lighter the color, the more the overlaps show, and um, that's why you get the streakiness. Um, but like I said, every color has its own uh, way of doing things, so the best way you're going to learn is to just do some swatches, practice, play with it, experiment, and um, see what happens. Now, in these areas of the collar, uh, in between all those black parts, um, we're going to be doing greens. And you'll see that each of these sections in here is divided up into uh, smaller sections, and they kind of 
go in a certain direction and what we're going to do is we're going to do a variety of different shades of green um, in a row and we're going to go from lighter to darker as we go along and it's going to create a, uh, a blended effect, like a gradient effect. So now we have our scribble sheet and we're going back to that and I've got a handful of pretty much most of the greens that I have in um, my Crayola marker collection. Also grabbed a turquoise in there just in case I wanted to see if maybe uh, we could get some turquoise in there. Um, but what I'm doing now is I'm just taking each of these colors of green and kind of looking at the caps to see, you know, what's the lightest to the darkest and going in that order. But um, as you'll see, if you do a test swatch, the uh, caps on these are not particularly accurate as to the color that the ink actually is. Um, these ones also uh, dry to a slightly lighter color, um, which I believe is true of most uh, markers, that they're slightly more saturated and a little bit darker when they're wet and they uh, kind of air out and, and lighten up as, uh, as that water or that alcohol evaporates. So right now I'm just getting a feel for what all these different colors look like and how they fit together as far as which ones are lighter and which ones are darker. And, um, and then I'll just decide which order that I want to put them in. So I've got five greens here and um, I've organized them from lightest to darkest. And we're going to start with the lightest. Now, the reason I have five different colors here is because I went through and I counted up all the different sections in each of those little areas, and the uh, one that had the most sections had five sections, so I want to be prepared for a maximum of five sections, and if there are fewer sections than five, then uh, they don't get the darker colors. And to do this, my preferred method, and you can do this however you want, but I tend to, to do these kind of patterns um, where I will do all the first color areas, although I often miss some and have to go back and get them. So I'm just deciding, you know, which end do I want to start the light to dark gradient on and putting that first lightest color in there. Um, and then I will be laying in the, the next color and the next color next to it in order so it goes from lighter to darker. I'm also paying attention to uh, the symmetry, so I want to have each side of this be like a mirror reflection of the other side. I want it to be uh, symmetrical. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm echoing whatever I do on one side on the other side. And you do not have to do this symmetrically. I happen to find symmetry quite pleasing. Um, I like the balance of it, but you could also do this asymmetrically, which means that each side is different. You could do a randomized kind of mosaic kind of look with these sections as well. Um, you could do kind of a stripey pattern where you go light to dark, light to dark. For this one, I'm using a kind of monochromatic pattern, which means that all we're using several different shades of colors, but we're all using the color green. They're all different shades of green. Um, now you can also do something where you have multiple colors. You could do a rainbow effect. You could do red, orange, yellow, green, blue. You could do um, red and green stripes. That's a lot of contrast. That's going to be very bright and bold and give a very different effect as uh, a monochromatic all green and just different shades of green. So that's just kind of giving you an idea of the, <coughs> pardon me, the different possibilities um, that you can explore in coloring. I mean, really the sky's the limit and there's just so many different ways that, that you can uh, play with these colors and do interesting things with them. So we got that first green, that lightest green laid in there, and now we're going to take the second lightest green, the slightly darker green shade, and we're going to put that right next to it. And our third color going in here now.
for the kind of makeup or face paint around her eyes, I'm going to choose uh, one of those greens that I've already used and um, I'm going to use like that mid-range kind of basic green um, and that's going to tie her face paint in with the colors of her outfit. And I'm also bringing in that uh, light color kind of yellow green onto her eyelids there to bring some more of that color into her face. And I've noticed that I've missed a few spots so um, I'm just kind of giving this a look over now and seeing if I missed anything and filling in any of those areas that I uh, missed on the first pass. So for these little bits that are sticking out of the headpiece here, I wasn't sure what color I wanted to do them um, but I think I do want to keep them black because I um, I like that idea of those black shapes and I want to do her hair a light color so you get that interesting dark shape against the uh, lighter colored hair. Um, I've decided I'm going to switch to gel pens for this because there are some very small details in there. And um, just to add a little bit more interest, I'm going to use a dark gray, almost black glitter gel pen. Now, to pop that dark shape of that headpiece, I said I wanted to do a lighter color of hair, and so I'm going to do a yellow blonde kind of effect using three different colors of yellow from uh, my Crayola marker set. And when you first see them, they might look like they're all really similar, but um, when you do those test swatches, you're going to see that there are there are differences between those colors um, and they do go from a more cool almost slightly green yellow to a very neutral solid yellow to a kind of a golden orangey yellow and we're going to use those three different colors to create uh, a kind of three-dimensional shiny effect on the hair and you can see here on the hair how it's kind of done in sections and the sections are all flowing a certain way so you can see kind of how the hair is swept up and back and then you have these braids up along the sides and then you have kind of looks like braided buns or twisted buns on the back there um, so we're going to be stroking our, our color strokes along basically with the flow of that hair um, and we're starting out along the outer edges and we're kind of feathering that first initial light yellow color in there around the edges and now I'm taking that slightly darker yellow and leaving a gap between these two colors and I'm feathering that edge there and again I'm feathering it with the flow of that hair so it looks like it's kind of streaky in there um, you get that texture of the hair and what you're doing when you're leaving that white gap there is creating a highlight. So that would be the part where the light is reflecting off the hair the most, so it's the shiniest. So you would have that bright highlight along that kind of curved edge there, and then it's going to get into the darker, darker deeper colors um, down toward where it's meeting the face. And now here we're going in with that deeper golden yellow um, down along the lower edge of the hair there. And on the braids, I'm going to use that darker golden yellow to kind of define each of those little strands that's twined around each other. You're going to go around kind of the bottom edge of each section and then you're going to use the lighter yellows on that top edge. Okay so we have that kind of yellow blonde hair going on in there and we got all those greens going on in there and the black and I think it's looking good but those yellows and greens are all really pretty similar to each other so I want to pop up this color scheme 
um, and punch it up with uh, some kind of red or pink or um, that kind of color because I want it to contrast with that green. So let's take a look at our color wheel here. Now, contrasting colors are across from each other on the color wheel. Um, contrast describes a relationship between colors. So if we look at the red and the green, those two are across from each other on the color wheel, so they are contrasting. Um, colors directly across from each other on the color wheel are also known as complementary colors, and they are called complementary colors because they complement each other. Now, a lot of people think that these colors look really bad together. They just clash. They're loud. They're like, ooh, jangly, you know, they hurt your eyes a little bit. But if you keep in mind that all the different shades of red and green are also complementary to each other, then, you know, you get a little more leeway and you might not have those same kind of ugh, really bold effects if you're using a softer uh, shade of these colors. Um, but they still do create a contrast effect. And one of my favorite uh, contrasting color combinations is orange and blue. Um, I really like doing a kind of greeny turquoise blue and, uh, and a nice orange. And I just think that's a really beautiful kind of exotic looking color combo. So how can we use uh, complementary colors to create some drama in our piece and to add some bright, punchy, boom color? Well, I've tested a bunch of reddish kind of colors, and I've chosen this one that's kind of a magenta, almost pinky. And um, I'm going to use that to do the inner edge of the eye and the lips. And on the lips, you'll notice that there are some weird little blobby shapes in there, and those indicate highlights. Um, if you want to make her lips glossy, you would leave these solid white um, with a real hard edge on them. If you want to do a softer satiny look, you're going to do a slightly lighter shade of your darker lip color and maybe blend those edges a little bit. Um, or you can have them be all one solid color and that's going to give you kind of a matte lipstick effect or even a natural look if you're using a more natural uh, a lip color. I'm also going in here with my marker and um, layering on some little deeper shade in the corners of the mouth and the underside of the lips where uh, you know, the light is coming from above so you're going to have that light on top, you're going to have those highlights on the top sides, the top surfaces of the lips, and then on the underside where the shadows fall you're going to make that a little bit darker. Um, now this is actually bl wet blending of uh, markers. <clears throat> which in general is uh, not recommended, but in a situation like this where you can, you want a little bit of bleeding and you want a little bit of, of that kind of look, um, that'll work okay. And in that case, if you are going to blend markers, uh, water-based markers, wet on wet, um, I recommend using a, more of a dabbing motion than a, a stroking motion. Um, so just kind of dab it on there and let it, it's, it's going to bloom a little bit and it's going to bleed a little bit and blend. Um, so you can do wet blending with water-based markers sometimes, just don't scrub the surface of the paper um, with your wet on wet or you'll tear it up and it's, it's going to look bad. Now we have these little uh, round jewels on these parts here and there is a little circle in there that indicates where the highlight is and I'm just going around those highlights and leaving them white so that looks like a, a shiny gleaming area on um, those gems and it gives them a kind of a three-dimensional look. And there are a few other little spots here and there that um, I think that red would look good and just kind of bring that red color in into different areas of the piece. On these uh, little hair decoration pieces, uh, I think I want to do something a little bit different instead of just the black and the green. I think I want to try a kind of the darker green and um, have the intersections be a uh, similar to what we did with the green but use pinks. First, I am going to color this part here. I don't want to use black because it will not pop against the other black that's already there behind it, so I'm going to use the gray color. Mm -hmm. 
and coloring these little gems with that same pink with the white highlight as I used on the headpiece. And I've skipped through some of this, but uh, basically I did the same thing I did with those green shades where I tested out a bunch of red and pink kind of shades and uh, chose a selection from light to dark. And now I am doing um, the colored areas, the sectioned areas on that little brooch there with different shades of pink. And I'm also bringing uh, some of those colors, those pinky colors, into uh, the headpiece and the hair decorations and earrings. And down here on the brooch, we're going to do a kind of a shiny gold effect um, using the same colors that we used on the hair and a very similar technique where you're going to have that white highlight area and then you're going to blend that into a light yellow and then you're going to get a deeper yellow and that's going to give it kind of a shimmery, shiny kind of effect. I actually want a little more contrast in this uh, shimmery gold area and uh, that golden yellow is not quite deep and dark enough. So I'm actually going to use that same burnt sienna color that we used uh, on the shadows on the face. And I'm just gonna blend in a little bit of that in the darker areas uh, to punch up that gold shimmery effect. And doing a similar kind of a thing on the earrings. A lot of this stuff I do is just tiny little things and you might not think they make that much of a difference but sometimes it's just those little details that really can make the difference between a flat boring coloring page and a really beautiful uh, well done coloring page. So now I'm going to do this kind of uh, twisted cord around the collar with my pinks and reds and purpley kind of colors. And I'm doing, again, lighter on the top and darker along the bottom so it gives it that kind of rounded three-dimensional effect. This uh, twisted cord would also be a good place to do an alternating color pattern here. You could do each twist a different color or two different colors and that would be a really interesting effect. Now, what are we going to do with those eyes? Um, in my mind right now, I'm thinking blue. I think blue eyes are just going to be electric and pop like crazy. So I'm going to try out a few different blue colors and see what, uh, what looks good to me. And I've decided on this kind of aqua color, which is from my Polychromo set. And it is uh, the light cobalt turquoise. And again here, I'm just laying in a nice light application, a base color for the eyes, which is this light aqua blue. And then bring in that same aqua blue into a few other areas of the piece to kind of, again, bring that color in and splash it around so that kind of coordinates all together there. Hi guys, on today's coloring tutorial, we're going to be coloring this picture, which is called Fae Enchantress from the Magical Beauties Coloring Book Volume 1. If you are a patron of mine, thank you, I love you, and you can find your free download for this tutorial on my Patreon page in the Patrons Only section. Just for you. So the first thing I do when I'm starting a coloring page that has a person or a character in it is figure out what color I want to do their skin tone. Um, now a lot of people ask, you know, what color is flesh? What color do I use to color skin tone? And the answer to that is that there's all kinds of colors that you can use for skin tones. And so what it really is up to is what kind of effect you're going for. Do you want to color somebody with a very pale complexion? somebody with a very dark complexion, somebody in between, um, you know, look around at different colors of people and see what uh, colors they are because there's quite a variety in uh, skin tone and complexion and all of that. So for this one, I want to do a very pale kind of skin tone since she's kind of a ethereal looking fairy type of character. 
in some of my books, including the Magical Beauties book, um, I use some grayscale shading in there to um, give you guys some idea of how to shade and shadow and where the shadows are going to fall. I also have a grayscale testing sheet included with that book. And what you can learn by using this grayscale testing sheet is the uh, level of transparency and opacity in each individual color because each individual color formulation, each pencil in your set has its own level of transparency or opacity and uh, you can use this testing sheet to discover that. So to demonstrate how this grayscale testing sheet works, I have two different flesh tones here. They're both kind of pale peach colors. One of them is from my Polychromo set and one of them is from my... So let's talk about our background here. Now we have these two areas on either side with these kind of swirly bits and then we have this kind of stained glass uh, thing behind her. And I'm going to bring um, this light blue back in. So this is a uh, similar color to what we've got in the eyes and the gemstone there. And this is uh, bringing that color once more into the composition. Um, and we're going to do a little bit of a, a gradient blend at the bottom. We're going to make it a little darker at the bottom and lighter at the top. And now I'm going to darken up this area at the bottom here and at this point that first layer is dry so I am uh, layering that same color up on top of that. These are the water-based markers um, and you can build color up by layering them but uh, make sure that you let each layer dry before you add another one. Now you can see here along that top edge where I'm kind of blending that darker color into the lighter one, I'm using a that feathering stroke so it kind of makes a jagged edge that kind of strokes up into that other color. And I've decided to do the outline around the figure um, also in this blue color. And I'll do another video about um, choosing colors to do outlines and, and go into that in more detail in a future tutorial, so stay tuned. Now for the central kind of stained glass pattern in the background there in the middle, um, I'm going to do a, another kind of reddish kind of color and that's going to pop that yellow hair um, and give us some nice contrast there with the green as well. And I'm starting off with a base layer um, with my marker and this is kind of a peachy salmon-y color. And then um, I'm going to add some uh, deeper colors later and I'll show you how I do that. Again, this light marker color is looking a bit streaky, but I actually think that looks really cool for a stained glass effect because some of that stained glass has a mottled streaky effect in it anyway. Now I want to give each one of those little sections of stained glass uh, its own kind of tinted tone and shade. And I'm going to do that, um, I think I'm going to use colored pencils for all of this. And I'm going to be using a selection of different shades of red, purple, magenta, warm colors, deep warm, reddish, pinkish, purplish colors. And I'm going to go around the edges of each section and I'm going to go down with a nice dark firm stroke around the edge and then I'm going to use some lighter pressure to uh, blend that kind of color into the base color. For each of these different um, kind of deeper red tones, I'm going to just kind of randomly select different sections to do in each color and I'm going to try to avoid putting the same color next to itself so that you get kind of a randomized pattern of these different reddish colors. This is a sort of dark purple shade and I'm using that to bring in a little bit of uh, deeper shading onto those lips there, just in the corners and the undersides of the lips.
For the pupils of the eyes, I'm going to do a deeper blue color. And I'm dabbing with that marker and um, just kind of layering and building up that color until I get a shade that's deep enough that I like it. Now I'm going to add some warmth and life to her skin tone by adding some uh, pinkish rosy shades. So I'm doing some swatches here of some red or rose or pinkish colors and um, just doing a very light uh, test swatch here over that flesh color swatch that I put down because you're going to be coloring that blush on top of the flesh so you want to test it on top of that flesh color so you can see how your colors are going to interact. And I'm going for a pretty natural look here so I don't want anything too garish, I just want a nice natural blush color. So just starting on the cheeks here with just the lightest pressure. You want to start this very, very light and you want to just kind of slowly build up your color until you get it to about where you want it. Um, this will help you avoid just making it look too garish like there's too much makeup. Just start really, really softly and slowly build up your color. And you'll get better at this as you practice and um, it really doesn't take long. It's just a matter of being able to look and, and know what you want and know how to get there. I'm also going to add a little bit of this blush color to uh, the tips of the ears. If you look at most people's ears, or at least people with paler complexions, um, their ears tend to be quite red. Same thing with fingertips, um, also the tip of the nose, and sometimes the tip of the chin. Everybody's a little bit different, but these kind of things, like most people do not have flat skin colors. Um, some women do wear makeup that evens out their skin tone, but most people, you know, when they get excited, they flush, or they get hot and sweaty, they, they turn red. So there's all kinds of different variations in colors, and you can actually use those to uh, create certain effects. Like if you want to create effect of somebody who's really excited, then you would want to give them a blush. You would want to give them that, you know, sense of excitement, that look of that, you know, flushed face. So just keep that kind of stuff in mind when you're uh, deciding what colors to use and how to um, do your skin color and how to em embellish and enhance your flesh tones. For this one I'm going for a very natural look though, not anything particularly flushed. Um, in fact, I want her to be quite pale so um, her blush and stuff is quite subtle. Now I'm going to show you burnishing and burnishing is a colored pencil technique where you take either a, a clear blender a white pencil. Um, you can also use kind of pastel light shades of various colors and I encourage you to experiment with this and see what kind of different effects you can get because like I said all the different colored pencils work a little bit differently and uh, you just need to familiarize yourself with uh, how they all burnish because they all burnish a little bit different. I believe that I've decided to go with the Prismacolor Light Peach for this. Um, it might also be kind of an ivory color, I'm not sure. Um, but basically what I'm doing is now going over all those flesh colored areas with very firm pressure and I'm just kind of rubbing that in and smoothing out that paper texture. And what burnishing does is it uses pressure to squish all those little tiny bumps that are the surface of the paper and that's why you get all your little graininess. You get all those little white bits showing through your colored pencil. What burnishing does is eliminate that graininess. It smooths everything out but you want to wait to do it until the end because um, after you burnish you're not going to be able to layer, uh, get those subtle layers of color that um, that I like to do as far as like doing you know the blush and the stuff that's very subtle and after burnishing the the surface just gets slick it's just like a layer of solid wax and you don't have any more tooth on your paper um, so that's why you want to do it at the end you want to get all your colors in all your subtle blends and then you want to burnish at the end to smooth all that down and it also brings the colors up a little bit so it saturates them a little bit and it just makes everything, makes those colored pencils really, really sing.
for the neck here, I'm going to leave that that deep dark shadow that we did the sienna brown on there. Um, I'm gonna I'm not gonna burnish that area because I already <clears throat> used a very firm application uh, with the brown, but I am gonna burnish the sides there where it's a little bit lighter and kind of blend that into uh, the darker brown color. And that's burnishing. So looking over the whole color scheme, I'm kind of not really liking that light blue uh, border around the figure there, so I'm just going to darken that up. I think uh, if you look where the, uh, the outline overlaps that light blue in the background, um, there's just not enough contrast there, so I want to deepen the blue of that outline a little bit so um, it pops her from that blue background. And I think that's about it. Now I'm just going to kind of look over my whole piece and see if there's anything that I want to adjust. Maybe something that's not bold enough, something that's not dark enough. I'm going in here with uh, looks like kind of a, a reddish brown and I'm defining the underside of her nose a little bit and that little dip in the upper lip there. Adding a little more shadow on those ears so you have that that kind of top front section that's coming up that's overhanging the other so I want to do underneath that top section just kind of shading underneath there to give it some depth and I'm just going over that dark area under the chin there with this kind of dark reddish brown color and uh, just kind of adding a little more richness into that area and now I'm adding a little bit of a uh, color depth here around the very edges to darken up those edges there. Um, this is going over the burnished area, so it is pretty slick. Um, it's, it is, you, I know I told you you shouldn't uh, <clears throat> color after you burnished. Um, you can color after you're burnished, possibly if uh, the paper will take some more color, but it is hard to get blend, subtle blends. It is hard to get a smooth application on that waxy surface. And I encourage you to try it. Try coloring on top of burnished and see how that works. And that will give you a better idea than me describing it to you, um, how, it, how it behaves differently after burnishing than before burnishing. So I've deepened those shadows there along the sides of the nose that kind of define the nose there. Also a little bit under the lip. And filling in these last little white bits that we haven't yet. And I'm gonna show you one last little trick here that I do with my gray uh, Crayola watercolor marker because this is kind of a, a neutral medium gray and it's transparent. It's really good for doing um, some really simple shadows. Um, so I'm gonna use it along underneath the eyelashes so it looks like that the eyeballs are shaded uh, by the eyelid and also along that ear that's casting the shadow, that part of that ear and then just along the underside of the jaw there to define that a little bit more. And with that, I think we are done. Well, thanks for joining me for this, guys. I hope you found it useful and um, I hope you will leave me some feedback because I really do want to know what you liked, what you didn't like, what I can work on and improve, um, what else you'd like to see and hear. I've got lots of ideas and uh, lots of plans. Um, and I also realize I need to work on my speaking voice and uh, get more comfortable recording. I'm working on it. But thanks for coloring with me, guys. I'll see you next time.